Ahoy hoy gang, if this is your first time with us, welcome! And if you're joining from a previous video, hey hey, we'd love to see it and I hope you're doing well. It's season two! The second season! I know, blew my mind when I figured that out too. Season two really genuinely feels like a continuation of season one, but not in any canonical sense, in more they feel cut from the same cloth. Season three, in comparison to the two seasons before, it almost feels drastically improved upon, which isn't bad at all. Just shows that these were all ideas they'd map for a full 22 episode season and just got broken into two parts. So let's see what they managed to work into a whole second season of the show Fox had no idea would succeed. Like always, let's ask those three age-old questions. What worked, what failed, what margarita mix consumption will be curtailed? Grab your crew, because it's time to talk season two. Teddy makes a joke and gives Louise a fake treasure map to find the treasure of the old taffy factory that's about to be demolished. Louise doesn't realize it's a joke and decides to get Tina and Jean to help her explore the factory. Naturally, they invite friends, so Andy, Ollie, Jimmy Jr., and Jimmy Jr.'s best friend Zeke, in his first appearance played by Bobby Tisdale, show up to look for the smuggler's gold. Zeke is a lot, but he's got a good heart and you can tell that he's doing the best with the situation, but him being so close to Jimmy Jr. makes Tina understandably jealous. She pretends to be like a book character to be more hard to get and it just doesn't really work. The kids run through the factory and yeah, sure enough, they get stuck in an elevator that falls into the basement and they have to find a way to escape before it's too late. What are Bob and Linda doing through all this? Oh, they're having the most awkward sex dice involved couples night imaginable. When they realize the kids are missing and in danger, they run off to save them and Linda had slipped Bob a Viagra previously, so he has to deal with that through the entire episode, which is just so normal, I guess? Like, it's such an insignificant yet absolutely valid issue to have to deal with in this chaos. It's just, it's so dumb and yet it works. I don't know. The writing is really solid, and when Louise falls down a further tunnel and runs into a taffy man, she confides that she does love her family, she's just frustrated by them as the Belchers run up and save their smallest member. We then get an ending song, sang by Cindy Lauper of all people, revealing there was in fact gold in the taffy man and the treasure was real the entire time. As the season premiere goes, honestly, it's a perfect example of how you reintroduce characters. Sure, Gene doesn't do much, but what he does do sets who he is as a character. Remember, they had to develop the show not only around broadcast, but also streaming, so they had to be consistent while also eye-catching for new viewers. Musical number by a rock and roll legend? Hey, that helps. Big bombastic race against the clock to get the kids before the factory is demolished? Hey, that's not dull at all. Like genuinely, it's a really solid display of what Bob's Burgers does and it's a great intro to new fans if they were late to the party. Season two definitely feels more like an addendum than a new season proper. It's a continuation of the story, especially with the inclusion of Zeke here and Tammy later on, and fills out the world before they take a very noticeable jump. The Belchies is a well-chewed 10 out of 10. So, remember officers Jennifer and Cliffany from the first season? Well, you'll see their models around, but they'd be phased out with the introduction of Sergeant Bosco this season, played by the legendary voice actor and god king of authoritative Birdman voices, Gary Cole. Bob is over at the bank trying to negotiate his past due loan with Mr. Dowling, who has a very important call on his piece of paper. Mr. Dowling would be played by Craig Anton, who most would know as the dad on Phil of the Future. He's great as Mr. Dowling and his performance is just terrific. Bob jostles a cutout in his fury and storms off after holding the door open for Mickey. Mickey is a failed criminal who tries to rob a bank and he'd be voiced by voice acting SNL super talent, Bill Hader. It's Bill Hader just having fun and that's just great. The cops led by Bosco take over Bob's to stake out the bank and Bob has to bring burgers over to the starving hostages. First episode, escaping a crumbling taffy factory and treasure hunting. Second episode, active gunman situation. Even the playoff of Dog Day Afternoon is just, yeah. It's a lot of heaviness that if they were any other show, they'd fail at handling it spectacularly, but somehow Bob's Burgers manages to thread the needle with comedy and tension. They have Louise hogging the hostage line for Mickey to tell her his story so she can write her report. 
Gene is excited about robot college. Linda is willing to experiment. There's a lot of moving pieces and they're just so masterfully interwoven. Like Mr. Frond is one of the hostages and you really get to see him squirm which freely establishes his almost spineless character in the best possible way. And again, kudos to David Herman for bringing him to life like only he can. Oh, and fun fact, speaking of David Herman, we get the news reporter at the scene, Olsen Benner, played by Pamela Adlin, aka Bobby Hill. King of the Hill series review available now! The cops are trigger happy, Bob isn't trying to let anyone get hurt, it's a lot, and it absolutely shines because they involve the entire community in the event. This is beauty right here. This was absolutely fantastic, and I adored every bit of what I got. Everyone brought their all, and it's honestly still one of the best written episodes of the entire series. Bob Day Afternoon is a high tension 10 out of 10. The kids, in an attempt to get out of gym, coerce Mr. Frond into letting them do an independent study of synchronized swimming led by their mother, who regularly still does prenatal yoga. The B story is Bob gets an ice cream machine and feeds Teddy a sponge. Great times. Sometimes they're big, loud episodes. Sometimes they're Linda being taken advantage of and learning to stand up for herself. The kids always manipulate her into doing all the work for them, and even in the class, they do whatever they can to blow her off until she finally snaps and just lets Bob deal with it so that they won't have to do summer school. It's... it's a lot. Not gonna lie, it's a bit of a come down off the last two episodes, but it does still have some merits. It's a great display of Mr. Frond. We get a lot of great one-off jokes. The ice cream machine is amazing. We got Swarlet from this episode. But if I'm revisiting the series, synchronized swimming is definitely one I skip more often than not. It drags in some parts and the kids are very actively the antagonists, which just feels a little disjointed to keep things going. They're always forcing it to go further and further to try Try and get Linda to finally snap. Louise roping Jean and Tina into shenaniganery is a very common trend and can be done right even later in the season, but this just feels unnecessarily mean to Linda, which to the show's credit, the Empty Pool Showcase does rectify a lot of those issues and John Roberts makes Linda such an almost familiar character that you understand why she feels so hurt. It's those small details that make this episode still absolutely a fine watch, even though it does drag in some parts and does have some weaker elements. The repeated classes, the skipping and finding excuses to get through the final synchronized swimming performance, it just kinda drags on to an uncomfortable degree. It's still absolutely a fine watch, but probably the second weakest episode of the season. What's the weakest? Stay tuned to find out! Synchronized Swimming is a Caddyshack referencing 8 out of 10. You know, I would have said this was the weakest episode of the season when I was a kid, but now I absolutely know better. Bob gets an arcade machine to try and get some extra revenue. Burger Boss, a game he thought he was something of a pro at. He shows his kids his skills, gets up on the board, and then Jimmy Pesto, the diabolical diaper lover that he is, comes over and grinds all up on this man's machine, violating it in front of the whole family and getting first place on the board and writing Bob sucks at number one. This is where I hated the episode as a kid and now I adore it. Bob stays up all night playing the game and keeps trying to beat Jimmy's score until he eventually develops carpal tunnel and keeps trying to play with his crinkled hands and the power of God and painkillers on his side. This man is popping painkillers like they're Skittles, and Linda understandably sells the machine once she sees how obsessed Bob is. However, Bob chases it down to basically a family fun zone and gets shown the door by the security guard brought masterfully to life by Robert Smigel, who you'd know as Triumph the Insult Dog, who had a show alongside Jack McBrayer. All connected. He's great. Like, the character doesn't even have a name, and he's one of the most memorable parts of the entire episode because of his performance. Bob then decides to bring the kids to the fun zone, and they start raiding birthdays. Bob enlists the tutelage of a bullied kid, Daryl, played by Aziz Ansari of Master of None, and a somewhat recurring character. Gonna be real, glad we don't see a ton of Daryl. He's just... He's way too nerdy for me. I, I get what Aziz Ansari is doing with him, but it's just, oh, it is, it is grating to the ear. It just hits it wrong. Bob agrees to stop his bullies if he teaches him his gaming ways. So yeah, 
They do the training montage and then Bob takes a ton of painkillers, trips, and starts chasing the bullies thinking they're food. Linda has to pick them all up from the yacht club they're now banned from, and Bob pays Daryl to get the score off after he sobers up. Like, what did I just watch? But go back and rewatch it and ask yourself truly at your core, what did I just watch? It's a perfect encapsulation of Bob getting addicted to painkillers and fighting to reclaim his spot at the top of the board. This man is obsessive over beating Jimmy Pesto, which in the context of everything he's done, makes sense. He's not going to allow Jimmy Pesto to take another thing from him. The man's already tried to take his home, his job, and now he's taking Burger Boss from him? Oh yeah, he's gonna spiral. And honestly, I love it. I truly do. John Benjamin's delivery is perfect and elevates the entire episode. The kids are just having a wacky adventure along for the ride, and I gotta say, I love it all. I love everything at place. Everything has a place. Everything fits in a square. Burger Boss is a high scoring 9 out of 10. If there was ever a perfect episode of Bob's Burgers, it's food trucking. Bob is frustrated, food trucks come and take all his business, and even tries to have his whole family run out and stop them just to, you know, get pushed out of the way. We get the return of Randy, still played by Paul F. Tompkins, who is actually doing food trucking and is honestly supportive of Bob getting into the food truck business and wants to help him in his own awkward way. He's not even the only returning actor to the show, Megan Mullally would return as the oil spill singing Tabitha Johansson. And we'd get Paul Shearer, Dana Powell, and Dave Allen as additional characters. Dave Allen's back, you guys! We love to see it. He's great in this episode as one of the other food truck drivers. Honestly, yeah, the episode is flawless. Bob and the family go food trucking, Linda is a destructive driver, Tina becomes Dina and plays by her own set of rules, and Louise starts review bombing the other food trucks with Gene's help to take out the competition, which is all phenomenal and juxtaposed with Bob doing anything to make ends meet. If there were ever an episode to build into a full proper movie, why Warforce and not this? This episode could be made movie length, songs and all, with little to no effort at all. They do cross country food trucking and wacky hijinks ensue as they go to each festival on the kids' summer vacation. Have Fish Odor either be sponsoring it or have like a wacky racist thing where you got Randy, you've got Morton, like the, I don't know, Mortician Mobile, Teddy's there doing a whole song and dance. You can engage with everyone, still have this big long movie, and it doesn't feel like you're trying to stretch a 40 minute episode into a 90 minute episode. I don't know, it, it just, it bugged me that this wasn't the angle they went with, because this episode feels rushed in parts, but it's so packed full of amazing writing and great jokes that you just kind of want more of it. The stove blowing up gets me every time. Just the last, like, two minutes of the episode are perfect. The silent game? Magnificent. No notes. Food Truckin' manages to have like six side stories and resolves them all brilliantly. There's such a chaos to everything that it just works fantastically in my eyes. I know we'll be going away from these more eccentric ideas, but I really do truly love this episode. Food Truckin' is an easy listening 10 out of 10. Worst episode? Still no, but I respect your moxie. Bob has some teeth pulled and gets the good stuff. So, while he's still woozy, he accidentally kisses Gail, does a little grab ass, thinking she was Linda. Dr. Yap would actually be played by Ken Jung, who does a spectacular job with him. Gail becomes obsessed with the sordid romance that she thinks there is between her and Bob. Linda encourages it so that Gail can have her chase, and Bob decides to go up to Dr. Yap's mountain timeshare to hopefully get him and Gail to hook up to get off the hook. Oh, and Louise and Jean start getting into an assortment of competitions to earn the right to suck on a giant jawbreaker that they keep swapping from their mouths over and over and over again in probably the most vile display of the show yet. And so, yeah, Bob tries to run from his sister-in-law that is absolutely obsessed with him. Honestly, it's Megan Mullally and Ken Jeong that make this episode shine. I mean, there's a whole side story of Tina trying to use the Prince of Persuasion's dating tips to get her own grown dentist into her. And even the Prince of Persuasion would be played by Rob Hubel, aka Dragon Shumway. Seriously, the Adult Swim infomercials were great. They just, 
Oh, Dragon Shumway is one of my favorites. Fun fact, Randall Park was actually in the Broom Shakalaka one. And who could forget too many cooks? Dr. Yap is fine. You have Tina hitting on her dentist and Gene and Louise swapping this jawbreaker while Linda pushes Bob to humor Gail until she suddenly gets upset over it. It's just, it's so much going on in one episode being approached from way too many angles. There are absolutely some great jokes, but they very easily get lost in the constant stream of things happening. They never let things breathe. It feels too crowded and it really only involves six people. It's weird. Still not horribly bad overall, but just a lot. Dr. Yap is a twice daily flossing, eight out of 10. Bob and the kids are going down to the farmer's market where they meet a great artist and Bob's occasional food friends. Pepe, played by Oscar Nunez, Reggie, played by Eddie Pepitone, and Tran, played by Russell Peters. They warn him that the Moody Foodie has hit each of the restaurants and he's got a pattern, so obviously he's coming for Bob next and he needs to be careful. The Moody Foodie would be played by nerd of all nerds, Patton Oswalt. So Bob begins to prepare and we get our first introduction to the mailman, Mike, played by comedic SNL wonder legend, Tim Meadows. Bob tries to put on a good show for the Hasidically Hidden Foodie and his kids are just understandably his kids and naturally screw everything up. So he writes a horrible review and is ready for Bob to completely fail. Bob then, as he's at his lowest point, decides to break into the Moody Foodie's house, tie him up so that he is forced to give him the second chance Bob believes he deserves. I, I, I kind of love that Bob never takes the moral high ground. He'll arguably do the right thing when things go to the point of no return, but he's not like Hank Hill. He's not the voice of reason in his neighborhood, or if he is, it is very rare. He's very efficiently going to make his life way harder than it ever needs to be more often than not. So yeah, he starts tearing into the foodie's mail, references Tin Cup, the other restaurant owners torture the foodie, and the moody foodie has a change of heart when he tastes Bob's burger with the cops on the line. The family watches Tin Cup. I mean, even then, at its absolute boiled down core, the episode is just amazing. Moody foodie is just great jokes, great performances, and a great time, all wrapped in one. It's just this display of controlled chaos, and yet there's never a point where it doesn't feel believable. They have steadily worked out to this point, and they know it's safe within that parameter. They know what the audience is comfortable with watching. We've seen Bob do more and more wild things, and this feels like a natural progression of who the Belchers are at this point. They're gonna torture a guy, but they're gonna do it as a family. And like, you can argue they do that in American Dad or Family Guy to an extent, or even The Simpsons, but Bob's burger shines when the whole family is flawed and encouraging each other to go deeper into those flaws. It's just this unequivocal support system between them all. And even seeing Bob having friends in the other restaurateurs does help flesh out the world and Bob's relationships more. It shows that Bob isn't this lonely artist. He's got friends and people that believe in him, and he's a genuinely likable guy. It may be small, but it is an important thing to establish. Doesn't really get built on all that much, but it is still fun to see. Moody Foodie is a well-reviewed 10 out of 10. Look, you knew it was this episode. You knew this was the worst one. You said, yeah, it's probably bad Tina, isn't it? Well, guess what, viewer? You've got that ESPN, and you're absolutely right. Bad Tina is just bad. Tina is finishing up some of her new erotic friend fiction and is wearing her best outfit since she's going to be showing a new kid around the school, Tammy, played by Jenny Slate, who would also play the lead character in The Great North. Anything I critique, please understand, is purely based off the character and not the writers, actors, or anything of that nature. I hate Tammy. I have hated her since this episode, and I have hated her in every single appearance I have ever seen her in where she's been anything of a prominent player, anything of a player. If I see her, my blood pressure just goes up. You wake up, have a coffee, relax, and start your day. 
I wake up screaming to the void for 35 minutes every dawn that Tammy from Bob's Burgers exists, have my coffee, relax, and start my day. We are not the same. Tammy is a curse upon animation. Tammy is a force for true and unbridled evil. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Tina takes Tammy around. Tina shows her her peephole into the boys' locker room that Tammy proceeds to ruin and they get detention where they start flirting with Zeke and Jimmy Jr. And that's, that's really the episode. Tammy pushing Tina further and blackmailing her when she refuses to go against her will, which in turn causes Tina to act out more and more and start to slip. Jean and Louise then proceed to blackmail Tina into doing their chores so they don't tell their mom what she's up to and Linda's being a real boob punch about it all. Tina tries to come clean and stop everything and even goes to Linda to get off the wild and crazy ride and ends up having to stop Tammy from releasing her erotic friend fiction to the world. However, she decides to beat her to the boob punch and starts reading her erotic friend fiction to the entire school as her teacher, Miss Jacobson and Mr. Fraun chase her down. I'll say this, Mr. Frond is probably one of the most realized characters David Herman has ever done, and he's, uh, he's done a few. I've listened to the man my entire life, he was in the first R-rated movie I ever saw. He is an institution in voice acting that does not get the celebration he deserves. But also, he usually does the same voices over and over and over again. Mr. Frond at least feels developed around David Herman's voice, and all the inflections land brilliantly. The rest of the episode is really just a return to normal, except Tammy is going to be a recurring character throughout the series. Yay! Tammy is in more episodes than Mort or Hugo. So if you love Tammy, you're wrong. And if you hate Tammy, buckle up. Bad Tina is a mind-sizzling 6 out of 10. Beef Squatch, Beef Squatch, more scotch, it's the season finale! Bob tries to get on the local morning show hosted by Pam, played by Samantha B, and Chuck, played by Thomas Lennon. Gene, in an attempt to get attention in a newly acquired Bigfoot mask, decides to run in and eat Bob's burgers on camera and goes wild for the attention. This gets the morning show interested and they want Bob and Gene to be their new Hey Good Cookin' segment hosts. Bob to make the burgers and Gene to destroy them in more and more creative ways. Bob, of course, hating that they're basically mocking his hard work and starts working with Louise to sabotage Gene while Louise helps Gene to sabotage Bob. Tina also is introduced to her new boyfriend who just kind of assigned himself to her, Nathan, who would be played by curse specialist and the guy always ready to help with his really good grades, Nathan Fielder. He's great because of course he is. I just genuinely wish he was in more of the show. That being said, this is where even romance-obsessed Tina recognizes that Nathan is obsessed with Pam instead of actually interested in her, and she has some amount of self-respect, which I do appreciate. She understands that she needs to get away from Nathan. She needs to put down boundaries. Linda steps in when Gene and Bob won't stop fighting and ultimately gets the show taken off the air by milking the cow, as it were. It's an odd burst of a season to wrap up, but I think Beef Squatch harnesses the chaotic energy that's been at play and really brings it all home spectacularly. If I have to choose between Torpedo and Beef Squatch, it's a thin margin for me to say Torpedo is the better season finale. And even then, a well-worded counter-argument would probably sway me on that. It's interesting seeing the Gene vs. Bob dynamic and how it's a pretty common one for the series. Even back in Spaghetti Western and Meatballs, we saw that Bob and Gene struggled to hang out and they've got this weird, awkward relationship. Here, they both want the spotlight and actually have something they're competing over be a shared passion. Bob has always wanted to do bigger things and be that kind of celebrity chef, and Gene wants to do something with show business, probably music related. They have a shared passion for fame that could unite them, but instead has them charging at each other with a vendetta. The Belchers are not perfect people at all, and the fact that they are usually the antagonists of their own stories is honestly perfect. It's what helped American Dad stay fresh for so long, and by letting everyone be terrible from time to time, you allow yourself more pieces to use to keep fleshing out story after story, which is super important when you had to produce 22 episodes a season instead of, say, 13 or the usual 10. And when we look at the next season, that's when the magic of this formula really starts to show. But for now, Beef Squatch is a show-stopping 10 out of 10. 
there we have it, that's season two! Anything you think I was right on, wrong on? What was your favorite episode? Least favorite? Let me know in the comments below! And if you liked what you saw, make sure to like, share, and subscribe! I'd be very curious if someone could sort of fuse this in season one into a proper one season order. I feel like it could be done, it just might need some finagling in different parts. Ultimately, yeah, another incredible season. While there might have been a dip here or there, it was never bad enough to bring down the season as a whole, but with a shorter episode order like this, those little marks and mistakes are easier to see. That being said, season three is really where we hit our Bob's Burgers stride. It's a significantly longer episode order that really lays the groundwork for what you can expect from the show going forward. We'll get a mutiny, a mannequin, a museum, and so much more that will make you squeal with glee when we sail into season three. Huge shout out to our patrons and members! Want to see content early, get exclusive posts, and get your name alongside these absolute champions? Consider signing up today! Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to stay strong, keep fighting, and know that no matter what, I believe in you, and you are going to do something great. I can feel it. And until then, I'll see you next time.